Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Melcher, the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit, and I'd like to welcome you to today's roundtable conversation. We are so excited to have with us today uh, Nathan Austin and Ida Benedetto. These are the brain trust behind Wonderlust. Wonderlust is this uh, innovative group that's dedicated to transgressive placemaking through adventure, intimacy, and exploration. Uh, I first came across them hearing about this amazing adventure they did in the Domino Sugar Factory, which I'm hoping they'll tell us about. But most recently, they've gotten a tremendous amount of press for their project called Night Heron, which was a speakeasy they built in a New York City water tower. Uh, so hottest ticket in town. I think there are only 10, 15 people who could get in at a time. Anyway, Nathan, Ida, so glad to have you with us. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Charlie. It's great to be here. Um, Alex, we also have, uh, we'd love to have you introduce yourself. Alex uh, Washburn, welcome. Glad to have you here. Sure. Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me here. I'm Alex Washburn. I'm the chief urban designer uh, for the city of New York over at the Department of City Planning. And um, someone who has a keen love for the city and is very interested in how we experience the city and the stories it tells us by walking through it. Excellent. Cool. Thank you for being with us. Alex, I'm going to ask also for you to try to speak a little more into your microphone because we're having a little trouble hearing you. Okay. Um, I also I wanted to say for anyone watching us today, if you'd like to uh, join the conversation, we very much welcome your questions and you can share them through our Google Plus site, Future of Storytelling, or through uh, Fost.org. Uh, tweet them in. So, um, okay, let's start. Um, so I thought, um, Ida and Nathan, I would ask you to just tell us a little bit about Wonderlust and some of the projects you've done. Um, well, maybe a good place to start is the um, photo safari that we did in the Domino Sugar Factory, since you brought that up already. Yes. Um, uh, I, I mean, the, the Domino Sugar Factory is such a huge um, fixture of the waterfront in Brooklyn, and most people know about it just from seeing it from going over the Williamsburg Bridge. There was a lot of fascination with it. Um, a lot of people who live in the neighborhood around there spent time working there. Um, so when it was, um, you know, went out of commission, I think, in 2008, and then a developer bought it, um, we wanted to see what that space was like from the inside um, and give people the opportunity to experience that themselves before um, it was transformed. Um, and by transformed, you mean before it was torn down? Yeah, basically. I mean, I know I know that one of the buildings is landmarked, but that just means that the outside is going to be saved. Um, so it's this beautiful relic of industrial history in New York City. Um, so we went and we explored it several times um, and created an opportunity for about 50 people to go in um, uh, and, and enjoy the space. And... Um, the way we structured that was we brought people in and formed them into teams and we assigned them photo captions and the teams had to go and take photographs to match the captions. Um, they were given free reign to explore one building in particular. Um, we wanted to give them enough opportunity to roam and explore on their own without necessarily getting lost or getting into trouble. Um, and people had a blast. Um, they were really mesmerized by the space. Um, uh, yeah. It, it was it was an absolute delight. We really wanted people to uh, experience the, the 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 industrial history in a really personal way, which meant actually getting your feet sticky in the sugar goo on the floor, and you know climbing on pipes and climbing inside of uh, old tanks that used to hold you know. To, used to hold sugar uh, in the refining process and to really get deep into that process in a way that you never would be allowed to do in any kind of official tour. Um, you know, we actually had people climbing inside giant tanks and, uh, you know, clambering, cr you know, crawling through holes in um, this really old building. And most of the, most of those spaces were, you know, were not especially risky or dangerous because it was, you know, everything was built out to OSHA specifications. It wasn't like anything was uh, crumbling and collapsing. 
Um, but it was, you know, there were like pipes covered in asbestos, and uh, there were, th you know, we gave people dust masks and things like that. There was, it was the kind of thing that it was a very hands-on uh, digging into stuff that you usually would, you'd, you'd never be able to do it in just some kind of tour. And we really wanted people to feel really viscerally what this kind of what moving through this space was like, and also to see this space before it's going to be gone forever. Mm -hmm. So, so your work really always is so grounded in a unique place. Um, and you, you do imagine or you, you are unable to give people an adventure in a place and let them kind of be the hero of their own, of their own story. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how, you, how you think about building these narratives or stories in a place? Sure. the uh, The first thing is the is the adventure. Well, the I mean, the place is the is the first character of any kind of story that we're building, and the first and primary character. And the adventure that you take through that place is the journey um, that you're that kind of carries you through experiences that become your own story. And those kinds of stories are some of the ones that we think are the strongest. The, the story that is your own experience of the city, your own experience of a very particular place, that is much more powerful than any kind of story we could bring in and put on top of it. Which is why we don't use actors or um, we don't use a, a script of a play or something like that that's on top of these, you know, this space. Instead, we want people to experience something that isn't what you, maybe would not what you would do part, as part of your regular life. Maybe you wouldn't be going into these places. But is something that um, the way you move through it is you moving through your own life in this in this place. And that is showing you stuff about, you know, that's, that's those revelations that come out of that, that story is revelations about who you are and what you're doing and what your place is in the world. Um, and that those we think that those are some of the strongest stories that people that people can latch on to. We do spend a fair amount of. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Charles. No, it's it's just sort of interesting to me because what you've just described um, about ex experiencing your life through movement, um, through a physical space, is really what we try to do every day when we design the city. Except that these are not not buildings of that are now empty, but they're just the everyday spaces that, that are going on. But there is um, there's something of really great value to taking the pedestrian point of view. It's very humanist it, that you observe the city, your life, through the perspective of, of walking walking through it. Um, and I think that's a very very powerful message for for how to conceptualize um, any anything that you do that involves public public space. How do you encourage people to to um, enter into spaces that have been neglected for some reason, or spaces that that are not welcoming, or spaces that don't, you know, that, you know, I I I at least I understand this at least as part of what you do. And this is, I mean, this is interesting. I'll tell you a story in um, in Sao Paulo that um, th there's a, a favela called Paraisopolis, and I'd gone down to to visit, and it was sort of a government thing, and they take me along, and I. I the favela was very famous because it's the one that has um, these apartment buildings just across the wall from it, and the, each apartment has a swimming pool on its own terrace, and it's sort of like super luxury against the, the favela itself. And I wanted to go see and walk around the favela, and my kind of government handlers wouldn't allow me to go. They took me there, and there's like a little yellow line, and they just said, don't cross, you know, and you have a camera, and don't, don't do it. And um, you know, I told this to uh, to people, and a wonderful young architect who worked in rehabilitating housing there said, "That's crazy. Let's go." And she just took me, and we walked through the, the favela. And yes, you know, we were stopped by some drug dealers. They wanted to make sure I wasn't a policeman, or et cetera. But there was no, you know, there was no no substitute for the experience of walking through. And it it brought home to me one of the fundamental tenets of public space which is everybody goes everywhere, that you cannot mm. have certain public spaces that are segregated um, for one part of the population or the other. Um, now, I think, Nathan, what you do is something more on the, you know, has to do with private property and, and other issues, but it, this is actually a, an issue 
in 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 New York of, a, of just a few years ago. Now I think we're very good about it, but in certainly many cities around the world, where you don't feel you have the right to go everywhere, but but you do, and that's central to experiencing the city as your place, as your life. I think sometimes we will take it to an extreme in the experiences we design. Um, uh, where people are definitely trespassing, um, but the benefit of doing that in in an experience we construct is that then when people go back to their own lives, their um, field of vision in the city and their sense of possibility is widened. So those spaces that are open and available to them that they never considered, maybe now they will actually consider them. And I think that that's one of our big hopes. You know what I wanted to ask you what what is how does this change the attitude of the people who've been on your tours towards how a city builds and, and develops. And I want to go back to an experience I had doing something similar to what you're doing, but on my own, which is the, the um, do you guys remember the Revere Sugar site in Red Hook? You know, it was torn down oh, a few years yes. ago. But, um, yep. you know, that's the place that I got to go. I'm, I'm an architect, so part of my job before I was in um, public sector was to go through old buildings and old factories and try to figure out ways to bring them back to life. And, and one of the things that made me fall in love with Red Hook, um, which is where I live now, was to go exploring through the Revere Sugar site. And at that time, I think it was owned by Imelda Marcos or, you know, it's like, it's like a decade ago or more. And there was this um, amazing street lined by these crumbling brick facades. And then at the very end, a stainless steel pantheon, uh, mm. which had something to do with the sugar process. And when you stepped into it, it was exactly the dimensions of the pantheon in Rome, but it was dark and steel and smelled of old sugar. And I know that experience is one of the things that made me fall in love with Red Hook and want to move there and, and live there. And now, you know, 10 years later, storms later, even that experience makes me want to keep that feeling of Red Hook or bring it back even as we get resilient. Somehow incorporate it into the future of Red Hook, that momentary sense of the past I had more than a decade ago. And this space, you weren't on, uh, you weren't on some kind of official tour when you went into this space, were you? You were just exploring or how did you find, how did, how did well, you find your way into this place? I found my way into this place because certain factions in Red Hook were vying over its future, and um, one one faction that decided that people with familiarity of saving old factories um, would be good to to bring along. So I don't know the degree to this to which this was organized, whether there was a real estate agent present or any kind of official there, but you know as a as an architect, you do explore, and, and these places can be dangerous, even though they're, they're built very sturdily. I had a, a colleague um, who got a job to um, renovate property in, in uh, Tennessee. Alex, I think we're l losing you there a little bit. You know, just, just a single crack in the floorboard and uh, um, sent him through down a flight of stairs. Oops. Oh. Okay, we Oops. had a little technical difficulty. Um, so listen, guys, I, I wanted to ask you about your sense of um, adventure in these places. Uh, place is hugely important, but you, to you, it's really about creating an experience, right? You're helping to create a, um, if you will, some sort of narrative experience uh, for your, I don't even know what you call them, your guests, your Participants. We we usually say, we usually say guests, um, and and the first thing I have to say to that is actually in response to something Alex uh, just said casually. Um, he used the word tour. Um, we we really don't do tours because for a number of reasons. The first of which is that when you are taking a when you're taking a tour, you are um, you're experiencing someone else's place in someone else's life. And we don't want people to be doing that. We want people to be experiencing their own life in their own place and to be owning this in some way. One of the things that I keep thinking about, and tell me if I'm totally off base as I listen to you uh, talk about the 
experiences that you create. I, I keep thinking a little bit about video games and about people wanting to be able to um, re live a certain experience that they can't experience in real life, right? Jane McGonigal talks about this, that reality is broken. One of the reasons of the huge population that plays video games and spends so many hours there is because they get some sort of heightened experience and, and gratification that they can't have in their, let's say, medial jobs or, or, or day to day life. Um, and I f keep feeling like you guys are creating real life video game experiences for people. Uh, We've had people describe describe our experiences like that. I, I have you have you told me some story about somebody saying that coming through this experience felt like playing a video game. What was yeah, who was I, that? Uh, I mean, I hear this several times. People will liken our experiences to specific video games, and I love connecting it to thinking of the connection to Jay McGonigal's work because we're 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 responding really sympathetically to that desire for adventure and that need for adventure to feel like actualized. Um, and to uh, leverage your agency in the world, but by doing it in real places and kind of interfacing with um, what people walk by on their daily basis. Anyway, in the city, um, it, it yeah affords them some way to like not just escape from whatever boring reality they have, but um, look for opportunities to be kind of creative um, and exploratory um, on their own. And I think the structure of our events is very much more like a video game than, say, theater, because um, you are having to like take all the steps yourself. You are having to choose where you go. Um, sometimes we have guides, but it's usually a matter of making sure people get through certain segments safely and then releasing people again with some sort of directive or mission, which they may or may not adhere to. Um, and how they choose to move through that is is totally fine for us, as long as they're present um, and they're owning that decision themselves, um, whatever they find there is usually way more exciting and potent than anything we can hand them. Um, so yeah, I love I love the analogy of video games. We use game design principles all the time in looking at what we design and how we design it. And I think the most compelling places that we find have a kind of richness and depth that is often accomplished in these kind of immersive 3D worlds um, when they're at their best, at least. Mm -hmm. And there's also a touch point to some of this new immersive uh, theater that's out there, the Sleep No More Experience or some of the others. Uh, but those are constructed sets. Those are clearly um, man-made for this specific story that, that people are going to get to experience in. Um, what's so wonderful about yours is that they are um, bringing us into something that already exists, right? You're sort of saying, hey, the world is, is a set and all the people but players upon it. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, so do, do your people who, who experience this, do they come back out into the public realm and experience the same excitement without a guided tour? Absolute, absolutely. So actually, um, when you popped off for a moment, Alex, I, I had a response to something you said earlier, which is um, about t the tour, this use of the word tour. So we actually don't ever do tours because at least to us, what a tour looks like is um, you experiencing someone else's life and someone else's place mm -hmm. and a thing that is not your own. You don't ever you don't ever tour your own stuff. You just live in your own place. Mm -hmm. um, this is the we always try to bring people into places, even if it's not a place they would normally be in. We try to bring people in in a context of like this is this is you experiencing this in your own life. This is part of your life now. This is not you experiencing someone else's life. Well, the minute you feel that it's your life, then you have a responsibility for it. And I've just, I've got a book coming out in October called The Nature of Urban Design, and its purpose is to widen the circle of people who feel they can change their city for the better. So do your people, once they've experienced this, feel care enough about it to change the city itself? Absolutely. Well, we'll we'll see. We, we've just started this, so we'll let you know. We'll see what the results can end up being. But so far, what we've experienced is that, for example, people would come to the Night Heron, the speakeasy we built in a water tower, and af I've I've heard many many people say that after this, um, they are looking at the city in a completely new way. They 
uh, never before thought about, in many cases, never before thought about how water works in the city and what this means, what the infrastructure of the water is in the city, what the, the skyline of the city is about. People look at the skyline and tell me, uh, now I'm imagining new things in the space of the city yeah. that I'd never imagined before. Yeah. And especially possibility. People saying, I never knew that such a yes. thing could even be possible. In fact, we, you know, we were taking people inside a place that people had not even imagined it was capable, uh, that you could physically, that was capable of physically holding people. The space inside, the physical space inside the water tower was somewhere that was empty. It was totally empty uh, mm -hmm. in people's minds. And by taking people into that space, even if no one's ever going to be doing something exactly in a water tower, that's not what's important. The important thing is that people now feel like their the space of their life in the city has expanded. Is it and just the... I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, you had told me once, Nathan, about um, that, that you couldn't buy yourself a drink there. You always had to buy a drink for the next person, right? And that has this, you know, not to, not to pump it up too much, but that's, that has the basis of civic virtue in it because the, the main way you change a city, because cities take so long to change, is that you do something, you change something yourself that someone else experiences later. Your children, maybe it's a generation, maybe it's a, a few years. But that kind of connection across time is a really hugely important thing to know about cities. That's fascinating. I, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time designing the gift system for the Night Heron mm -hmm. because it had to function a little bit differently than all the other ways we use gifting in Wanderlust mm -hmm. events because it had this time component. And so linking the guests to each other and having the gift giving between guests worked mm -hmm. remarkably well. Um, uh, and I, I love the idea of extending that to civics and how people kind of translate um, this sense of wonder and possibility, which we are very much interested in activating in people, to um, action and engagement. Because there are several steps between um, between that, those, those states, you know, um, believing in something and actually doing something about it. Um, and so we've gotten very good at getting people to believe in something um, or believe in the possibility um, or reframing their perspective on stuff. Um, yeah. Um, I see. I see. We have a question from somebody from a Google Plus viewer. Is now a good time to address that? Um, yes. Does Does Wanderlust favor older spaces, um, and how do they approach modern um, city spaces and architecture? Um, I do think that um, we have a certain love of older spaces. I have a background in history. Um, I love doing archival research, um, and I think the process of uncovering a logic that um, is lost in time. Um, is a process that we very much enjoy, um, which doesn't mean that uncovering processes that are lost in um, bureaucracy or scale um, wouldn't also be really enriching. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, are there any spaces that we're considering doing that with, Nathan? Newer spaces? I think yes, everything absolutely. we're looking at has a lot of history. Has what? I'm sorry? Has, has a, lot of, a lot of history, layers of history, or layers of lived experience. Um, we also like things where there's a lot of lived experience already happening in them. And so, so what we're activating is not simply a built structure, but, but a structure that has been lived in um, and uh, resculpted. Um, the, even in um, modern city spaces, and there are one or two places we're looking at that um, are really are, that are quite young, comparatively, historically young, even those places um, come on top of a, a, a history of something that came before. And the questions of like what was in this place before whatever is currently in this place can be really, really strong. And so, um, I don't know, we did an event in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, which is a current active living space, not, uh, I don't know, not some abandoned factory, totally active in, in current and present space, but the, the history there is still very, very deep. And, you know, the, the founder of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel died in the sinking of the Titanic. I mean, this is a current living space. You can go there, rent a room, totally pay no attention to that. But also, mm -hmm. like, there's there's a rich, there's still a rich history behind it. I love you that you think about the story levels of the places, right? Clearly, that's what part of what you're talking about is this layers of history and story that are there, and then letting people experience them in new ways and add their own experience, their own story on top of that. Uh, it really is. I, I have a question for I have a question for Alex. Alex, so sure. I know you you really like 
um, neighborhood or neighborhoods in New York City and the fact that each neighborhood in the city has a lot of character. Um, wow. Neighborhoods all have like their own stories very powerfully and the people that have lived in them and the history that's lived in them is is very um, uh, you know is very rich and that's one of the things that people mm -hmm. that people often point to in the city saying this is part of the strongest culture of the city but then of course neighborhoods are changing and especially people are um, I don't want to use the word gentrification but maybe that's the right word but na neighborhoods are changing a lot and new people are trying to like make their own spaces in their own life like is there do you do any work with making a space in the city so that people have in their present current life a, as strong a connection to the stories of a place or to the, the liveliness of a neighborhood as people who you know live there in the past how does that work well it, it works it works for me if the person if the new individual feels that they're changing their neighborhood and can change their neighborhood um, I'll tell you like today this morning you know my house got flooded in Red Hook and part of what I'm doing is trying to figure out how to make it flood proof and the ground floor is demolished and I was downstairs getting my bike and keeping my bike in the in the empty space there and this this very old guy walked by and peeked in and he started telling me what the space was 50 years ago and then he started naming every type of store that was on the block and even in places that there's no building anymore and painting this picture to me of Red Hook circa 1951 and in you know in the end it turns out his name is Marco he's 91 years old he looks like he's 71 but he's you know he says he's 91 and uh, he's great shape um, but that I I've got to bridge between his past and and our future because he stopped and and looked in and it's how do you ex how do you set up a connection with people who are already there is a big question about living in a neighborhood and and changing a neighborhood. Um, obviously, talking is is the way to do it. I found as an as an architect that the best way to to engage this is just sit down and start drawing. You start seeing details, and then people start walking over to you and telling you their stories. Yeah. So, uh, so give people a sketchbook this... and a pen. <laughs> it, so you when you feel you feel like you you are more. Um, connected or more present in this place when you are connected to this through line of stories. You said that the, this because you got you were connected to his stories of the past and what you know that you're building for the future. Is that what is that the thing that is making people be present? Yeah, yeah, and that's what got him interested in stopping and poking in and talking to me. He wanted to know what I was doing for the future, and he helped me connect it to a past that was 91 years old. You know, something I couldn't do on my own. Those are those are some of the best stories. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I would love to do an event that that would consist so of nothing but ninety-one year old people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if it's well, okay to express, express regrets about um, events that we've done, but um, one thing I really wish we could have pulled off with the event in Domino Sugar is to have former workers there and co-design the experience with them. And so, because the audience was people who, you know, might have lived in the neighborhood, but they didn't have any concrete connection to what the building was used for. And so how do we co-create experiences with people who actually have the most interesting stories to tell about a place, and then create an encounter that is, um, you know, about discovering those stories, but still about what the place is now and what it could be. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, that, but I think yeah, that's what your whole program is kind of subversive. Part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but see, your, your, your program is great because it's subversive. I think a lot of people come to your program thinking they're going to get an experience, and instead they get a point of view. And, you know, the, the real stuff they're going to learn, the real connections they're going to make, they have to make on their own. But if you've kind of changed their point of view enough through one of your experiences, the wanderlusts, I think they become much the city becomes much richer for them. You know, then they have to go out and you know and give the experience to someone else. Hey guys, I, I I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the um, thing that we something we've talked about before, which is this idea of heightened emotional experience, right? You you are creating something that leaves people feeling all their senses in a way that that storytellers 
uh, dream of being able to do, frankly. Uh, most media is too mediated to let people be able to uh, have that kind of emotional response. Or, or anyway, we aspire to it. Storytellers aspire to it. And you guys have done a beautiful job. Can you talk, talk just a little bit about the magic of how you do that and why and why it really works? Heidi, you want to talk about the magic circle? Um, sure. Um, well, uh, when we were talking um, earlier, we, we mentioned how there's so much interest in like um, location-based technology and screen-based experiences, um, and the work that's needed to get this technology to be anywhere nearly as good as our senses, which is much older technology and much better refined. Um, you know, it's, it seems a bit futile sometimes. So, like, why not just have an embodied experience in, in a physical place, dealing with other, you know, computers that are the most complicated computers on Earth, which are other people. Um, uh, and so by, by creating experiences that way, we, we're using the best technology we have available. Um, and part of my hope is that, um, not, not that this is, you know, should, should be is better than screen-based experiences, or that we shouldn't be layering real places with information through technology, but just that th these things afford different different stuff. And sometimes that emotional impact really comes from being immersed in a place that has so many layers to it that even us as the experience designers don't have full knowledge or mastery of all those layers. Um, and by making it about an encounter Are you guys between... familiar with the Eleusinian Mysteries? No, tell us about it. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm, I'm not an expert, but that's it used to be in ancient Greece. You'd um, go um, to a sanctuary of Asclepius, I think, and you would go through a, um, a series of physical spaces that would prepare you mentally to be cured and heighten your emotions. And I think they were, as their name, they were very mysterious, but it, it <laughs> I know very little about it, but it's bringing back this, this juncture of emotion and space and moving through space. I mean, and this also harkens back to, you know, medieval medieval labyrinths. So you have to, like, mo physically move through a maze um, in order to experience, you know, uh, religious transcendence. Um, or memory palaces, which are, like, you know, physical pieces of architecture that are designed to be able to, like, hold memories. But it's a meeting of that built space and our minds that allow that memory to be stored there. Um, yeah. And so how do we how do we create new memories or how do we activate memories? You know, all, the, all of this stuff is in play. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm answering your question, Charles, about, about emotion and heightened emotion, but... I, I think you are. I mean, I, I think it's such a great backdrop to you know, all the technology that's going on and, and people spending so much time immersed in their digital lives, and you guys are helping to... Re, uh, remind us or sort of reinvent that the original sensors are those in our bodies and that you can create uh, immersive experiences that are more powerful and emotive um, and make people feel more alive uh, than anything that we've been able to come up with yet using using digital storytelling or, or other forms of storytelling and so it's it's like the oldest of, of ideas and also somehow wonderfully fresh and being reinvented by you today Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we, we are also very interested in using some fairly old-fashioned and clunky forms of technology to tell stories. And um, one of the things that we're exploring right now, Ida, can can we reveal this? Uh, can sure. we talk about the? Um, <laughs> okay, we can't resist revealing this one, and we've been talking about. Okay, it so yeah, much. we can't. We've been talking about this for a long time. We're um, we're we're developing something that's going to be using radio. Radio, very old-fashioned radio, in a way that radio is not normally being used. Um, so you know, we're doing some different things with it. But um, but we really love we really love radio, and we think radio is you, you know is totally has new things that can be done with it. Um, and yet, you know, radio is not super sexy in comparison to something that's new and you know something that's new and shiny. Mm -hmm. But it is something that like can help make you be more present. And that's the thing that we... So anything that we are using, um, the real question is not, oh, you know, does it have batteries or does it not have batteries or, what, or whatever, or, you know, 
uh, is it solar powered or not? The real question is, does it make you be present? Does it make you be more in your own space and in the life of this experience? And does it, you know, does it help you on the journey towards building something that is going to be a powerful story that's your own story and that's your own, you know, path through this space, whatever this place is? Um, so, yeah, we, we're really excited to be using some radio, um, and we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but we we think it has a lot of possibility. Um, and I think the same would go for any number of other things that we might attempt. Mm -hmm. it, it makes me, just hearing you speak now, it just reminds me of uh, Joseph Campbell and his hero's journey uh, and the discussion that he unearthed from all of these classic myths, uh, this idea that every hero has a... A uh, mentor, right, is is taken on, goes on a journey, is encouraged on that journey by a mentor, mm -hmm. um, who also somewhere along the way gives them a magical gift. So uh, Moses and his staff, or uh, Dorothy and her ruby slippers, um, and I feel that in a way you guys are providing that kind of hero's journey experience, transformative hero's journey experience, and you play that role of the mentor, uh, just sort of helping to guide them to find their own. Uh, new land, you know, and, and defeat their own their own uh, demons, and and somehow come out the other side to a world that's transformed. Often, all people need in order to do something really powerful is, uh, or, or and do something transformative in their own life, is just a small amount of permission, or or just a small amount of encouragement. So most of the time, all we're doing is giving people some permission, even if the thing that we're doing is illicit. We're saying, we're going to make a safe space for you, even if this space is not actually very safe. You're still responsible <laughs> for yourself. I, I mean, even the city is not very safe. At any moment, you could get whacked by a taxi, <laughs> and that's it. Um, but sometimes, in order to, to explore further in your life, you just need a little bit of permission to say, it's okay to to explore in a way that you haven't explored before, or it's okay to um, try something that you haven't tried before. And so we're always looking for new ways to give people more permission to dig in deeper. And that's one of the, th and, and we feel, I think we feel like we have a, a very small toolbox uh, that we use to do this, and we want to make that much bigger. And that's one of the ways that we're, you know, we feel like we have a lot to learn. And we, we often look for the audience that would benefit most from being given a little bit of permission. So instead of trying to like build a consistent audience of people who will come back to one event after another that we do, we often want to change it up because um, people who kind of develop expectations or become experienced junkies, like the that kind of transformation that we can offer them, it, it gets deadened pretty quickly. So we're always trying to um, reach new people or different audiences or the right kind of audience for the particular space that we're fascinated by and I think that that's also an interesting thing to, to think about too is like like you know who, 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 what guests really need this space you know who needs that invitation to do something different or unusual um, who's gonna find that most challenging and thus feel the most triumph for doing it uh, yeah. I th again, I just sort of salute you guys. I think everyone who wants to change the city needs a mentor. I think to absolute, can, I think that says it all. <laughs> well, perhaps on that note, uh, we, we've sort of run through our time. Um, I do want to say how excited I am, Ida and Nathan, to be working with you, uh, having you help us m mentor and experience at the Future of Storytelling Summit. Uh, this October, so thank you. I'm really excited to be working with you uh, and want to encourage uh, anyone who's listening to check out the website, futureofstorytelling.org. I uh, hope you'll be able to come uh, join us. Uh, thank you all for participating today. This was really a fascinating conversation and um, hope to continue it uh, in person uh, very soon. So again, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Charles. Great talking to you, Charles. Charles. Great talking okay. to you. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.